Our next guest advises us to leave early and cycle home as the key to well-being, not only in life, but also to productivity and work. Find out how his career has taken him from Scotland now to Switzerland, how pension funds the world over aren't actually that different, and about some of his adventures in between. I'm Ethan Devitt, and welcome to the 50 Faces podcast, a podcast committed to revealing the richness and diversity of the world of investment by focusing on its people and their stories. I'm joined today by Doug Heron, who's Chief Executive Officer at CERN Pension Fund, based in Geneva. He was formerly Chief Executive Officer of Lothian Pension Fund, and prior to that, held a number of finance industry roles throughout banking and asset management. He's a trustee director of the NatWest Group Pension Fund. Welcome, Doug. Thanks for joining me today. Hello, Ethan. It's a pleasure to be invited to talk with you today. I'm a big fan of the series, as you know, and really love the angles that you're taking with it. So, yeah, a a great pleasure. And thank you again for inviting me. Absolutely. Our pleasure. Well, let's start with your journey into the world of investing. Where did you grow up? What did you study? And how did your investment career start? I grew up in a town, as you might be able to tell from my accent, just outside of Glasgow in Scotland. My journey into professional life was what you might call a conventional one. I developed an interest in maths and economics through school. And as a sort of natural progression of that, I went on to matriculate for undergraduate honours degree in accountancy and finance. That was in the 90s. It seems like a long time ago when I say it now. And I was fortunate enough to be one of the final tranches of students to enter university before the Labour government introduced student fees in 1998. So that was one hurdle that I didn't have to overcome, but so many do now. My first graduate job was on a training program with an international life and insurance firm in the southwest of England. Back then, you applied for jobs by completing paper applications and posting them all in by a certain date in what was called the milk round. I think I applied to training programs of 30 or so firms, went to something like 10 assessment centres all around the country and opted for the firm that I thought demonstrated the strongest commitment to training. So it was there that I completed my professional accountancy exams while working across different rotations, getting practical experience of reporting, analysis controls, treasury and things like investment back office. I really enjoyed that variety and had the chance to learn from some brilliant people in a challenging but supportive environment. I remember the executive sponsor of the programme describing the arrangement as being one where you'll be allowed to stumble but not fall. And that was definitely my lived experience. After that, I moved firms and progressed into leadership roles in banking, retail investment management, investment platforms, and then pensions where I am today, 22 years on and counting. And I would usually ask if there were any surprising turns, but I would say that probably one of the surprising turns was in the last few years when you moved to Switzerland. Can you talk a little bit about your decision process in that and how the experience has been? That's right. I think you would call that a bit of a twist. We're now in spring here in Geneva. So just a summer season to go and we'll have completed our first full year in in Switzerland as a family. The opportunity, it was a surprise. I was invited to come and take on the role here, but it just came at at the right time for us. And so far we're making the most of it through learning French, skiing and, and making new friendships. I've always been motivated by opportunities to learn and to experience new environments. And so I guess you could call that a taste for adventure. But for us, the timing was just perfect with the age of my kids being old enough that they've got some awareness and interest and are able to form part of the decision-making process, but not so old that you really disrupt a sort of more advanced education. So just perfect timing. But, you know, this isn't my first time working overseas. Not long after qualifying, I worked at a multinational bank that back then was looking to gain a foothold in mainland China. And so I took the chance to move to Beijing in 2005 and stayed there for three years. And what was a very different culture to anything I'd experienced so far. Hugely enjoyable experience in life and something I learned so much from. So while Switzerland and wider continental Europe certainly differs from the United Kingdom and perhaps increasingly so, you might say I'm not exactly out of my comfort zone here. It's so interesting. But certainly moving country is not something to be taken lightly. Maybe the more senior you get in a role, I'm not sure if it gets easier or more difficult. Would you say there's any kind of a a manual that you would recommend in terms of 
how to approach that cultural change. Do you listen a lot? Do you ask a lot of questions? Do you make a lot of inroads maybe and to try to build your network? How have you approached it? I think if there's a manual available, I'll buy it. Please direct me to it. But no, I don't think there's an easy way to do it. You're changing role. You're moving to a new house. You're entering a new tax environment. You're entering a new professional environment, a different regulatory world. I think at one point I had a spreadsheet tracking all the things I had to do just before moving and something like a hundred things on it. And it's quite overwhelming. So I think anyone considering a move internationally, first of all, I couldn't recommend it more in terms of the development and the experience in life you'll get from it. But don't underestimate the, the amount of energy that you need to sort of have available to make it a success. So, yeah, we were ruthlessly organised. We, we had to be and, you know, just very fixed. One thing that made it harder is we were attempting to move during COVID as well. So that created just one more hurdle. But yeah, be organised and, and open-minded. But in terms of getting here, listening is, is always better to talking in the, the early stages of, of everything in life. So learn from those around you. Don't be afraid to ask advice and be yourself. Take time to get to know people. Be open and you know, you'll get a lot more from the experience. That would be my advice on an international move, definitely. And I'd say, even though there was tremendous change, one of the constants as you move from one chief executive role to another maybe your investment beliefs and some of the core beliefs that just don't change. How do you characterize your main investment beliefs? I often think of beliefs as being things that you might form as an individual and that you hold deeply and permanently or, or at least durably. On a personal level, I'm quite traditional, you might say conservative. And when it comes to investments, I always seek first to understand where cash has been generated or where it will be generated, then look at the risks attached to that cash flow and then ask myself whether the price for exposure to that expected cash flow is suitable for me. So if you like categorising things, then I think that would probably label me as a, as a classic value investor. And maybe I'd add to that, I've got a preference for firms that are committed to growing dividends, not just a full reinvestment. So that belief for categorisation means I probably wouldn't have had a good few years against benchmarks that have been heavily dominated by growth factors. And right now, if I was a classic value investor, I'd be asking myself some pretty deep questions about what value, price and equity risk premium really mean at the moment. There's quite a lot going on in the outside world and many are struggling to get a real read on some of the signals. But yeah, on a personal level, I would say I'm a classic value investor, but I would stress a separation between personal and professional. When it comes to professional investment, and certainly for the role of a CEO of a pension fund, you almost have to park your own beliefs and, and detach away from whatever natural mindset that you have. And instead, you have to work within a framework, multiple stakeholders, lots of advisors and research, typically quite tight funding tram lines, and then volatility or risk constraints. So you work all of that into an asset study and an asset allocation, and then you design an implementation of that that balances risk, return and cash flow, and you execute it, analyse those results, on short and long-term horizons and then feed the results back in at the top level and just, just keep repeating that process never too often and never too long a duration either. So that for me is you have investment beliefs, but in a pension fund, you really just have to fit into a process and a model. And you personally, I find it all hugely fascinating. And translating that now, the kind of overarching beliefs into your day-to-day -day at the helm of CERN, What's at the forefront of your mind now and how similar or different are those issues to what you face at the helm of Lothian pension scheme? I think the team here are probably tired of hearing me say it's just pension funds. There's nothing different in the CERN pension fund to any other pension fund. And I really mean that. But to begin on this, to most people, CERN is one of the world's most profound international organisations. And Right now, I'm sitting just a few feet away from the Large Hadron Collider, which is the product of a collaboration of 23 member state governments, each contributed resource, funds and political backing on quite a massive scale to secure powerful scientific insight that's changing the way we view the world. But the forefront of my mind in the pension fund is making sure that we play our part by providing secure retirement incomes for all those people who have powered the organisation throughout its history. Unlike corporations and private sector 
defined benefit pension funds. Employees of international organisations typically have no state pension to fall back on. So the pension from CERN is even more vital. So that kind of brings me to my number one priority. And to be honest, all other priorities are subordinate to this. The key focus is simply making sure that we pay and continue to be able to pay those pensions when they fall due. That was exactly the same as life in the LGPS, but with a different context, a different funding model. And here, my operations are on a more international scale, but very similar in terms of the themes of what work we do day in, day out. And sometimes the context can inform your focus, maybe in the local government, stakeholder, activism, a pressure can inform maybe the direction of an investment portfolio and its responsible investment policy. Your context there, surrounded by so much science, has that fed into any of your investment approaches, thinking perhaps around ESG risks and maybe desiring to have impact? Yeah, I think back in my previous role, I certainly was not immune or shielded from political pressure on investments. I say political pressure, it's much more than that. First of all, it's typically well-placed pressure from taxpayers, from members of the fund, from government bodies to really make sure that the investment is consistent with government policy and it typically is aligned to various policies that you have. So I certainly had a lot of discussions around the right thing to do on investments in in energy firms. And here, we don't have the same day-in, day-out interaction with government on what we invest in but it's quite clear that we all must and I don't mean must because we are pushed to do it we must because we simply must be a responsible investor and to put ESG issues on the table for every part of the investment process so it's no different in terms of I would expect scrutiny of every investment that we make and I would expect that where we have an investment that is low on ESG credentials that you have to demonstrate that you're the right owner for it. And so part of the philosophy that you know I've always had as an investor is just because something scores low in the ESG doesn't mean that I should divest it. Actually, it might be that I'm a more responsible owner than somebody else might be. So what I should do is I should use my time, I should use my resources, and I should use my profile to compel that management team to improve the ESG outcomes of the firm. And certainly in my past life, it's something I did often. We didn't just talk about it, we really did it. And so when it comes to ESG, I I think that that would be my summary. Disinvestment or divestment is often the first call from those that are critical of you holding that asset. But if you are the best investor to secure a better outcome for the world at large, for society, then you should use your influence to do that. It doesn't always work. And, you know, if you end up running out of time on an engagement with a management team that's not responsive, then it's time that you call time on that and you withdraw your support and look to sell the asset. But very similar between funds that I've been involved in. And just before we move on to talk about some of your other interests, just to finish on the investment topic, have you found that any approaches, say, to investment, maybe not just ESG risks, but risks on the whole, differ in continental Europe? And I'm thinking of things like maybe approach to, say, private credit investing or private equity or liquidity. Did anything kind of strike you as being different or did it really just come back to it just being a pension fund, as you mentioned before? I've got experience of many different firms and how they approach ESG specifically and, you know, the investment process generally. And in every firm that I've been involved in, they've had a different model. You know, it's been unique to that firm, but each time it's felt right for that organisation. So I'm involved in one UK fund that is mature, it's close to new, and it's approaching a position where it's able to contemplate de-risking. And so the approach to each individual asset class, but also the strategy as a whole and its risk appetite differs from an LGPS fund I've been involved in, where it's open to new, it's very well funded, but it's dealing with a a sort of a 90-year horizon. And it's got very strong covenant, so it can afford to remain long on equities and, and tactically overweight the equities within that. And then here at CERN, what we have here is an approach that is making the best of a sort of a reasonably tight risk limit. I think one observation I have of 
certainly investment or institutional investors across continental Europe through interactions I've had so far, is that risk and quantitative risk is much more prevalent within the investment process than certainly what I would find in comparable organisations in the UK. So quantitative approaches, risk limits, frequency of trading seems to be more common. But otherwise, it's still just the same broad brush asset allocations, just with slightly different uh, percentages in each and, and different risk constraints. So I wouldn't say that there's a, a European style that's different to the UK. Instead, what I'd say is, you know, each fund that I see is doing something slightly different, but usually there's a reason for it. So it's a, a long-winded way of saying not really a particular difference. On ESG, one observation that I'd probably make is that the UK, in my experience, seems to be quite far ahead or front of the pack on things like TCFD and the stewardship code. And I think the UK government has been a very active sponsor of developments in that space. I won't always have thought when new regulations appeared that I wouldn't have been pleased uh, because typically they've involved quite a lot of work in the past. But in continental Europe, I don't see governments being quite as active yet, but it's coming and we're all heading in the same place and we're all going to arrive at the same destination, which is much more focus on active responsible ownership, clear policies on climate risks, quantitative and qualitative disclosures on assets and actions. And on the risk front, ESG will always have to be part of a risk process. And I think we're all heading to exactly the same place. That's certainly reassuring for anybody who might consider taking a position abroad that some of their principles will still apply. I want to move on to talk about some of your other interests because they are quite extensive. I know that they include coaching football or soccer for our American listeners and animal welfare via the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. Can you comment on any of these and maybe how they inform your approach professionally? Yeah, that's right. I think I'm very fortunate that some of my professional experience has opened the door to some exciting voluntary and non-executive opportunities. And a a few years ago, I was honoured to be asked to support the work of the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland at an exciting time. There was the the arrival of a a sort of a very famous polar bear cub at the time and a need to sort of invest quite heavily in infrastructure around one of the sites. But I really enjoyed that. But I think far from being time that I've volunteered or given up, I've actually come to think of it more as time that I've invested. I've learned a huge amount from my work with RZSS in terms of animal conservation, but also even charity governance and and the risks in various financial models based on grants. So I don't know if you'd be familiar with banking concepts such as uh, investment concepts such as ICAP, but you know ICAP is effectively regulations that, that protect against investment firm failure. It prescribes how you go about measuring and allocating the firm's financial resources uh, as a buffer against losses. And it includes provisions such as orderly shutdown. So you've got to have a, a sort of a plan for how you would shut down a financial services firm so that it didn't cause any detriment to wider, I think we'd say, systemic stability or, or it couldn't impact the wider financial system. So, so anyway, uh, that's a long way of saying there's regulations in the financial services world that go into setting out the need for this wind down plan. But would you believe that there's also regulations in the animal conservation sector as well that are pretty much exactly the same? Firm, uh, zoos, I say firms, I mean zoos, have to have ring fence capital and orderly shut down plans so that there's no detriment cost to the organisation, including the animals that, that are being, being conserved. So a long way of saying it's not a single dimension of I've volunteered time. It's actually I've invested time and, and learned a great deal from it. I still bring out some of these things in, in my professional work as well as hugely enjoying that. And of course, coaching a team on, on the other aspect of your interests is, uh, I'm sure, a great skill when it comes to an investment team and managing a team within the investment context. Coaching football is something that you know I originally got into through my kids and a group of dads were talking one night about how we'd all enjoyed youth sports and it was not ideal that we didn't have a local football team and so we decided to create one. And so thanks to, I think, one or two individuals, we created an entire new football club, which is, there's a lot goes into it. 
you know, even critical decisions like what colour should the strips be that I, I think led to some ferocious debates among the coaches. But we got a club off the ground within about eight months. I think we raised something like £12,000 of, of sponsorship funds. And at one point within the first year, on a single evening, we had something like 90 kids under 10 all playing in a training session at the same time, which was just really, really rewarding. But I enjoy that. I think a bit like you know, managing in a professional setting as well, you have to encourage quite a lot. You have to give feedback in a constructive way and you have to communicate clear plans. So I certainly wouldn't say that managing youth football is at the level where you need to have uh, sports psychologists and uh, statisticians and, and things, but you do need to encourage people to do their best and give feedback in a constructive way and communicate the plan so that everybody knows what's going on. So, yeah, I don't want to betray any gift that I have as a, a sort of moneyball-inspired sports coach. But, uh, yeah, I've certainly enjoyed it and it's been very rewarding for me personally. Well, certainly massive respect I have anyway for all the youth coaches. It's not something I probably would have the patience for, <laughs> but essential parts of the youth infrastructure. And another area you've been very supportive of has been for more diversity in the investment industry in particular and around financial literacy as a whole. And what's your current thought on the state of the industry maybe and, and what more needs to be done? When I think about this, my overall sort of rating would be good, but nowhere near good enough. That's certainly my assessment so far, but I do like the direction of travel. When I compare the industry that I joined it's certainly very different to what I see in front of me now, and I'm pleased about that. At CERN, 100% of my senior team are female, and our 27 colleagues that make up the pension fund are from 14 different nationalities, and together we speak, unfortunately, often in the same meeting, 10 different languages. That's not diversity for appearance sake or because someone's told us that we need to do it. It's diversity that brings new ideas, it challenges the status quo, and it ensures that we keep an open mind and broad perspective. So with diversity, I don't think it's just the right thing to do. I do think it's the right thing to do, but not just that. It's the best thing to do. I've worked closely with some great organisations who I think are really shifting mindsets. Just one that I you know, sponsored through, you know, my previous pension fund is Future Asset. That's an organisation that is helping school girls or school age girls to see and imagine a future in the asset management sector. And, you know, I feel confident when I say that, you know, if my nine year old daughter should ever choose to join this sector, then she'd join it in a much better shape in, in every respect than when I did. And I, I think that's a great thing. With Future Asset, we I think had five single day workshops with school age girls and we were able to talk to them about what we do. But it's not just a bit like, you know, my volunteering time. It's not giving up time for a greater good. You actually get so much out of it as well because we got some great questions. And Future Asset is an organisation I think is, is doing great work, as I should say, are you? And just highlighting positive examples of progress that we're making in diversity. So uh, yeah, good, but nowhere good enough is what I would say on that front. Well, that's very kind of you to say. And certainly I do know Helen Bradley and Future Asset and follow their activities and competitions on LinkedIn. And it is a fantastic organization, which if we could replicate that and their energy many times over across all of our economies, we'd be doing well. Let's just move back to some personal reflections now and look at maybe over the course of your career, we've talked about your sense of adventure. Have there been any setbacks or challenges that you've learned lessons from that you can share? <laughs> Certainly have been. I think I would be honest enough to say that I reflect often on things that I could have done better. And I think the older you get and the more experience you have, you look back and realise that approaches you, you've had in the past could have been better. And I think it's that reflection that, that helps you to keep developing. So I'm a big fan of journaling from time to time. I'll look back at a meeting that I've had and, and I'll maybe just think back if I was in the meeting observing what might I have said about my presentation or what might I have looked at differently from, from what I said and so you try not to be too harsh a critic of yourself 
But you do look at that and, you know, I worked at a firm in the platform space where we just had this really healthy approach to admitting when we were making mistakes. So maybe in traditional organisations, if you spend the budget and you're almost there with something, you never stop. You complete the journey. You don't write off the investment. And then you end up living with something that isn't perfect. But the platform that I worked with, if at any stage, no matter how much we'd spend, we felt that we weren't going to be happy with what we were going to get or that time had moved on or the client no longer wanted what we were building. You just quite freely wrote off the investment. So, you know, you called an end to it, you wrapped it up, you would do some notes and you would maybe preserve it for later life, but you wouldn't ever beat yourself up just because you'd spent money on something. And I think there's a philosophy that that's really healthy. So, yeah, I've made lots of professional mistakes and within that, there's lots of things that, that I could have done better, but maybe keeping relevant to investments. There's one lesson that I've learned at a personal level about investments and that's to never invest based on your own consumer experience. Whoever you are, you aren't representative of the entire market and your experience as a consumer is no guarantee that others will feel the same or that such consumer experience will translate into a successful investment. So if I expand on that, I invested in something and I doubled down on initial losses a few years ago absolutely convinced in my mind that because of my brilliant consumer experience that the market was just wrong and uh, there would be a correction and the firm that I'd backed would go on to be really successful. Anyway, I ended up licking my wounds after several years of hope and disappointment, but having learned a vital lesson. So how would you invest? I would say invest on data, invest on research and on risk analysis. But whatever you do, don't be caught up in your own consumer bias. But anyway, I'm not going to tell you what that investment was. <laughs> we won't press on that, but that's really interesting. Actually, that is a remarkable humility because often we, we tend to think that our, our experience is representative, but I suppose it's just a reminder that one anecdote does not equal data and to perhaps step back. I love that. Looking at any key people, maybe in your career, was there anyone maybe that had a particular influence on you that you can mention? I've been fortunate enough to work with many great people in my career and, and, and to work in some great organisations. I try to be influenced a little by many great people rather than attempt to impersonate any one person, no matter how great they are. So I think if you spend a lot of time trying to be someone else, you know, in any setting, you're ultimately going to fail or you're going to lose the things about you that are unique and brilliant. So. I observe people closely and I often informally label people as being role models and just try to learn from them, but lots of little subtle influences rather than any sort of a attempt to mould myself on someone else. But a major influence in me in, in the past was just a friend that encouraged me to take on an international role and I think persuade me of the benefits of international experience. So. And that led to me heading off at quite a young age to China. And I learned a great deal about the world and myself in those three years. Travelled widely. I learned part of a new language. Uh, I certainly wouldn't say I learned a lot of a new language, but learned a huge amount about how different organisations behave in China at the time. A lot of organisations were not focused on profit, but actually they had alternative KPIs, very different KPIs. And so the way those organisations were run was very different. So it's not to say that you sort of take a Western mindset and you try to impose that on the rest of the world, but actually you sometimes just step back and say, maybe actually there's another way. And, you know, I try to do that a lot, but a lot of that's just due to, you know, a friend that really persuaded me that international time, no matter how much of a, I think how daunting it seemed, would be a good thing. So, yeah, that's influence. Yeah, it sounds like I think I'd probably be always that friend. I'm always encouraging people to take risks, especially when it comes to travel, because I'm passionate about that myself. You've given us already lots of words of wisdom, certainly around investing and team management, etc. Is there any creed or motto that you live by or any particular word of wisdom that has stuck with you? I think uh, for me, uh, I try to, and I would say that some people might say I'm obsessed, but I try to focus on eliminating waste and keeping things simple wherever I am 
I don't like clutter. I despise inefficiency and indirect processes, particularly where they affect members, as we would say, or beneficiaries in the pension fund world. And I absolutely hate having to read anything twice because it isn't clear. So if you walk by weak controls, inefficient processes that don't serve members or beneficiaries in a pension fund context, and you ignore or overlook confusing or unclear policies, then you're essentially leaving a problem for someone else to fix. So I tackle all of those things as much as I can, and usually as soon as I see them. But unfortunately, it's often to the point of distraction. So creed or motto, I think, for me, is keep things simple and eliminate waste and make processes as direct and efficient as you can. And that's something that I do. I'm not saying everybody I work with is a fan of that approach or is particularly pleased when I, when I sort of arrive and say, can I just give you a few observations on this particular member journey? But ultimately, I, I believe that good things happen in the pension fund sector, at least for, for members and beneficiaries when you adopt that mindset. So that's, my, that's definitely my motto. Not a bad one for the sustainable future we all are hoping to create either reducing waste my last question is any advice you might have for your younger self? Maybe the young man, maybe before you went to China. Is there anything you know now that you wish you had known then? I think if I had the opportunity to give my younger self advice, I would simply say leave early and cycle home as often as you can. The benefits to physical and mental health of doing that are phenomenal. And ultimately, you'll perform better in, in every respect in your personal and professional life because of that. So leave early and cycle home. I try to do it as often as I can here, and I love it. But when I think of all the times that I took a taxi at 10 o'clock at night because I was working in something that I didn't want to stop, all that I learned after that is that the next day you're less productive and less happy. So leave early and cycle home. <laughs> That's my simple message to my younger self. Well, I love that reminder about well-being. Well, Doug, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you here. From the very first time we met at one of those online conferences, I think we were both on a panel, your warmth and your clear allyship has been really notable. And I have been delighted to watch your star rise as you've taken you from Scotland now to Switzerland. And thank you so much for coming here and sharing your insights on investment and life with us. Absolute pleasure. And thank you again and uh, keep up the great work. I'm Ethan Devitt. Thank you for listening to the 50 Faces podcast. If you liked what you heard and would like to tune in to hear more inspiring investors and their personal journeys, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice and all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest.